Okay, greetings, peoples. Welcome to the discussion stream for May June two two. No, sorry, sorry. I'm May June two two paper two variant three. Give me a second while I hit my settings a bit. Uh, shout out to you if you're from MCK and yeah, trying to figure out how to study for AS. For two two oh ones, you got this. One day at a time, okay? Alright, so let's go and see. Before you start this stream, make sure you have tried the paper. If you have not tried the paper, let me warn you that you can you have to learn physics by doing. Okay? If you if you say, Oh, I, I I'm just gonna watch Miss Ellie solve some questions. Okay, I just see Miss Ellie solve questions and I will magically get good at physics. Oh, it doesn't work that way. So, you don't learn physics by seeing people solve questions. You learn physics by doing the questions, struggling through the questions, and then you realize, oh my goodness, I don't know how to do this. Let's do some exercise, okay? So, it's okay if you try this paper and you get stuck at many, many places. I try papers, I get stuck too. Okay, it's part of the physics learning progress. You cannot memorize, you gotta solve. Okay, so um, some people ask me, Miss, is this paper considered hard, average? I kind of scan through the um, recent great threshold a bit and we are right here. Wait, it's 2-3, right? Moment of hang. Okay, yeah, 2-3. So we're somewhere here. So 40 for an A, 9 for a pass. It's maybe on the moderate to easy side a bit compared to some... Actually, wait, hang on a second. No, 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 no. If the threshold is low, it is on the moderate hard side. Okay, okay, sorry, moderate hard. So I will call this moderate hard because these numbers are considered low-ish. So yeah, probably some tricks in there. Let's find out. Okay, let's go straight to the questions. So this is a live stream discussion, a live recording. So I will be doing recording while streaming. So this, you see me do all this behind the scenes between my takes. So, okay, without further ado, let's go. Question one. So make sure you got some questions tried already, if you have not. Okay, let's go. A solid metal sphere has a diameter of 3.42 with some uncertainty. A mass with some uncertainty. Okay, calculate the density of the metal. So density, you gotta remember. How do we find density? That's mass over volume. So, what volume is this? A metal sphere. Hmm. Sphere means your volume is going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Okay, let's plug it in. You could do it in two steps. I'm going to throw everything into one step and just boom, everything there. Okay, so mass, uh, oh, let's, let's write this out one more. One more line of equation. So I'm going to do mass over the whole thing. 4 over 3 pi r cube. And let's go. So mass is 67. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a second. This is in grams. And the cm is the diameter. Should I convert to SI units? Uh? Hmm. I do not think we need to. Because. Because. If you look at the final answer line, they want it in gram cm. So I don't think we need to, which is great. Okay, so always check the units on the answer line because sometimes, just because they can put some other values. Okay, never mind. So we're in grams. So 4 over 3 pi radius. Okay, there's a trap here. This is diameter. Okay, diameter means it's the whole diameter of the circle. You only want the radius, which is that centerpiece up here. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to take 3.42 divided by 2. And it's all in CM, right? Don't you convert? All right, so just Q. Okay, so if I plug in all these values, I should get roughly a value of 3.198879. You should get something similar. But for the final answer line, you can write it to 2SF. So 3.2. Generally, 2 to 3 SF is okay and acceptable. Ding. Okay, so 3 marks here. Wow, 3 marks for calculating this. Very generous. 1 mark is for the equation of density. It is helpful to start by writing the equation. So I know what, what equation you are using. Just in case you plug in the wrong numbers. 1 mark comes from your calculation of volume. Do you know V is 4 over 3 pi r cubed? 
you could write a separate calculation or you could do something like what I did here. So this is for volume. If you did it separately, you will get a value of 20.9 cm cube. Okay, lastly, final answer. Okay, next. Determine the percentage uncertainty in this density. Ooh. Uncertainty. Hmm, let's go back to the main equation. I'm going to rewrite this, uh, equa this equation here. Let's see. I want to find the uncertainty in rho. Highlighted in green. Where does my uncertainty come from? I have some in diameter and some in mass. So mass is going to contribute some uncertainty inside there. Radius related to diameter. Okay, some uncertainty inside there. But be careful, there's a cube here. Radius times radius times radius. Three radius. Okay, so let's go and write out the equation first. If you want to use percentage uncertainty, if I want to find the percentage uncertainty in density, rho, Remember, so now we say what contributes uncertainty? Mass, right? So we got uncertainty in mass, one here, plus uncertainty in radius or diameter. I think we can just go with diameter. But be careful, there's a cube. So you need to multiply by the power. So uncertainty, multiply by power. Okay, we have to use percentage here. We cannot just add, oh, miss, I just take mm, 0 0.02 plus um, 2 grams. And that's my uncertainty. Wait, wait, wait. 0 0.02 is in cm. 2 is in grams. How do you add different units together? Cannot. Okay, no, no, no. So you cannot just add the absolute uncertainty. This is called absolute uncertainty. They have their own units. We need to get rid of the units. Okay, so let's write out the equations down here. Um, I'm going to convert to fraction uncertainty. So to find the percentage in M, I need to do absolute in M over M value plus three times the absolute uncertainty in D over the D value. And this whole thing, because percentage, I need to times 100. Okay, let's do it. So mass. 2 grams over 67 grams. Okay, this gram and gram, you do not need to write them because they cancel out. Very nice. Next, diameter or radius, up to you. You can use either one. Yeah, why am I writing triangle? 0 0.02 over 3.42. Close bracket. So if I just leave it like this, instead of a percentage, I'll just get a fraction. So I want it in percent, 100% as the maximum, so I times 100. So with that, I should get, or you should get about 4.73946, blah, 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 blah. There's more numbers. But you can round it off to 4.7. Or 5. I recommend for, um, for percentage uncertainties, keep your two decimal place, or rather 2SF. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. You can also write as 5%. There's no strict rule for percentage uncertainty. Okay, so two marks. One comes from you putting together the equation to combine the uncertainty. And one for final mark down here. Okay, so a quick reminder, we times 3 here because of what again? Power 3, right? There's a R cube or diameter cube when you're calculating the volume. So this is related to the power three. Okay, I think that's all for this first question then. Good revision of how to deal with uncertainties. All right, let's go. Yeah, now it's a trial period. Lots of trial papers going on. All the best for your revisions though. <sighs> My nose is killing me. Okay. This is a projectile question coming up next. We have a hmm, very nice projectile question. Okay, let's see. Archery over here. An archer releases an arrow towards a target at a velocity of 65 and an angle of 4.3 above the horizontal. Where's my angle? Okay, there it is. So when released, the tip of the arrow is a horizontal distance 70 meters from here. Pew! fly all the way to that side. 
and 1.6 above the ground. The arrow hits the center of the target. So assume that air resistance is negligible. Very nice. Don't need to worry about drag force and all those other things. Okay, and all the mass of the arrow is at its tip. So although our arrow is a nice long object, we're going to assume it's just a point mass. Show that the time taken for the arrow to reach the target is 1.08 seconds. We, we, when we see this kinematics kind of question where object is moving, my recommendation is you set up your stuva information. See what is your, what information do we have? Yeah, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the horizontal component of things. Okay, so S-T-U-V-A, stuva. Say it with me, stuva. Okay, horizontal distance. Your This arrow is going to travel. A distance of 70 meters. So I'm going to put there 70. Time, I, I need to show, I need to show that it's 1.08. Initial speed, okay. Mm, that one I can find. Because, because of the initial speed and the angle that they gave me. Mm. So, let's draw a little triangle here. Uh, we want to find this horizontal component of velocity so you're gonna launch it at 65 meters per second at an angle 4.3 degrees so your horizontal velocity is this ux over there which is adjacent hypotenuse cosine so we go 65 cos 4.3 Velocity? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Acceleration? Horizontal? I don't have. Uh, zero. Okay. So, looks like we have enough information to use a stuva for the horizontal. S equals to ut plus half at squared. But since it's horizontal, I might as well indicate this. S of x, u of x, acceleration of x. So, we travel 70 meters at a speed of... 65 cos 4.3 and time acceleration at the back don't have uh, we just plus zero but you don't need to write it out so just this is fine okay so you should get a t oh it's getting very low down your t value you should get 1.07996 or round off to 1.08 which is what we were trying to show over here okay so Ah, one thing that we always say is, Miss, can't we just use, you know, uh, S equals to V times T? Or, or rather, distance is velocity. Distance is velocity times time. Can't we use this? Oh, it's the same thing. It's like our stuva here. Because there is no acceleration, you can also write this as distance equals to U times time. Or, since initial and final speed is the same, we just do V times T. So, this is the version that we may have seen before we do A-levels, okay? So these are the same things, except that there's no acceleration here, plus zero. Okay, two marks. One comes from your equation, okay? Either version of this, d equals vt or the whole stuva equation, it's fine. And of course, you sub in your values to get the final answer. That's A for accuracy. All right, next, calculate the height of the center of the target above the ground. So you are, okay, let's go back to the picture a bit. We are going to somehow hit the center of the target right here. Bullseye. Nice red bullseye. So, hmm, that's a little below our initial, it might be a bit be below the initial height because here is the height, but then it goes a little below though. Let me see if I can draw it. Okay, we got like that. Pew, oi, wrong color, sorry. <laughs> that is pew, drop down. Mm. So I would recommend we start off by writing the stuva. If you're not sure how to start, stuva is the way to go. Just list out what information you have in the vertical component. Let's go. S-T-U-V-A, stuva. Okay, vertical displacement. 
I think we will try to find that. Time we know is the same from before. See our 1.08 here? That's the time it takes this arrow to travel this pink color path and hit the target. Whether in the horizontal or the vertical is the same time. Same arrow. So it's right now, 1.08 seconds. Initial speed, we go back to the triangle we draw here on the left side. But instead, we're trying to find the vertical component now. So we're going to do, instead of cosine, we do sine. So let's write it down. 65 sine 4.3. Final speed? Don't know. Doesn't matter. Acceleration. Oh. What is pulling the projectile downwards? Hmm. We're on planet Earth. Probably have gravity which is always pointing downwards at gravity due to acceleration 9.81. So, write it down, 9.81. But before we happily plug in the values, there's one trap you need to be careful of. This one, uh, the object goes up and goes down. So you must define your direction. Where is positive, where is negative? So I think I should write a reminder here. Define, I'm going to choose for this system, anything that goes up is positive. Any vector that goes down is negative. So acceleration 9.81 is negative. Initial velocity is going to be positive. So here's a trap to be careful of. Highlight that if you try the question and you're like, oh, I don't know why the answer wrong. Okay, positive, negative. Go back to the picture. See this arrow? It's going up. Here, 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 here. U, Y pointing upwards in the beginning. So we give it a positive. At the end, uh, acceleration is downwards, 9.1. So we're gonna give this a negative. So we get correct values. Okay, now let's plug in. So I think we have, hmm, what equation should we use? Uh? S equals, what do we have? S, T, U, and A. I think it's back to our old stool bar. S equals to U, T, plus half a t square. So good job if you thought about this one. But to remind ourselves, we only use all the vertical components. So I write all these mini mini y's over there. Okay, we want to find the displacement. Huh? So let's go. 6.5, eh, sorry, 65 sine 4.3 time 1.08 plus half negative 9.81 T square. Please remember the square. I forgot. Then I press calculator, I got wrong answer. <laughs> okay, so you should get a negative value. Don't panic, stay calm first. It's okay if you get a negative value. 0 0.45768 blah 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 blah. So is answer negative 0 0.46? No, not yet. Not yet. Don't so happy yet. 0 0.46 meter is the displacement from the original height. What do they want? They want the height above the ground. So plot twist. Let's go back to the picture. So displacement, <clears throat> uh, initial displacement here I can assume is S of Y is 0 where the arrow starts. So it means all along this dotted line, S of Y is 0. Which means if I have a negative value, it's negative 0 0.46, the object has gone below my initial starting point. So negative 0 0.46 meters. This is the displacement um, here. So this SY, negative 0 0.46. Ah, here's the trap. And they want you to find the height above ground, which is this H. So we know this whole height is 1.66. We know that the arrow falls below by 0 0.46. So we can just minus 1.66 minus 0 0.46 to get the height. Tricky, tricky Cambridge, why you do this? Okay, let's go. So to find the height above ground, we're going to take 1.66 minus 0 0.46. Okay, so this will give us, I kind of round it off to have the same Significant figures, uh, sorry, same decimal place. One, two, one, two. Easier to minus. So this will give me 1.20 meters.
So the answer is not 0 0.46, it is 1.2. Okay, so final answer is one mark. Uh, one mark is from your Stuva equation. One mark is if you get, you know, sub all the values into Stuva, you get a value here. Uh, that's the in, in between. But that's not the final answer. Okay. So that's this projectile question. Uh, way to solve it. Hope that was helpful in revising kinematics a little bit. So can you find time taken from max height to center of target? Oh, maximum height. Ah. You could... It's just extra steps. So you can split it into two parts. Kind of like this. Goes to maximum height. And then for maximum height, it comes down to that. Can. Also can. But you don't need to because the Stuva equation already takes into account the whole curve path. Because this, this um, 1.08 seconds here is the time taken for this whole pink color path. So 1.08 second. It is also the time taken for an object to move um from the starting position all the way to a horizontal displacement also 1.08 it is also the time taken for an object to go vertical motion from here uh sorry uh displacement let's use a yellow color from displacement zero go up and come back down down <laughs> to negative 0 0.46. This whole process also takes up and down 1.08 seconds. It's all linked together. Yeah. So curve path 1.08. Go up and come down to position below 1.08. Time taken to travel from left all the way to the right also 1.08. Okay. Yeah, any questions so far on this one? Ooh, can we divide the time by half? Mm, I don't... I hesitate to say that because it may not be symmetrical. So you, Okay, so if the target... If we end here, like here, then your path is symmetrical. But then oh, the projectile doesn't stop there. It goes below the original position. So we cannot just say, oh, it's divided by 2. So for example, like this, you go to maximum height, you come back down. Maybe it's 2 seconds to the top, 2 seconds to the bottom. Stop. Ah, then this one can. But if you want to say, um, I want to go down somewhere below my position, I don't know how much time this is. So we can't assume that it's exactly divided by half anymore because of this extra part we go below the original height okay so this one is tricky because it goes below the original height here so we cannot divide by two yeah. stuva is your best friend so you all to revise go learn up your stuva equations and how to use them be careful of the signs huh? must define okay let's go next uh next part Oi, got one more part here i uh i stopped the recording just now Forgot there was one more section. Oh well. I'll just hit record again. Okay, so this last part. Last part C. By considering energy changes, state and explain how the final kinetic energy of the arrow as it hits the target compares with the initial kinetic energy immediately after release. Numerical calculation is not required. Ah, basically you say don't calculate, just explain. So, okay, let's draw the path. Let's say I start here. It's my reference point. I launch the arrow. It goes up. Goes down a little bit below. So just now we learn, uh, we calculate that this one goes below 0 0.46 meters. Negative just means below the initial position of 0. Displacement, 0. So, kinetic energy. Hmm. Let's say I start here with a kinetic energy of, let's say, 2 joules. When I reach this same exact height, it should be a kinetic energy of also 2 joules. But then I go below the initial position. So this kinetic energy 
should be more than two joules. Okay, so in this case, mm, I think we can call this our start and end point down at the bottom. And overall, because of the decrease in height, there is a decrease in gravitational potential energy. Where did the energy go? To kinetic energy? Oh? So in this whole process, I'm write that down, GPE is converted into kinetic energy. So there should be more kinetic energy because you start here, but you go lower than that. So how do we explain in English for two marks? We can say, well, what do we need to do? Uh? State, explain. State, you say what? What's the answer? Explain what? Uh, how the final compare with initial? Uh, bigger, smaller, larger? We say it's more. So we can say kinetic energy has increased. Okay, this is the final one. But we need to explain. Now this explain, when you see the word explain, they're asking you why. Why you say increase? Uh, so we have to say, hmm, because, because, oh, because we go below. The GPE, must talk about GPE. So because the GPE has decreased. So, KE, increase. GPE becomes KE. Okay. So this one, you say GPE has decreased. This one is a M1 mark, M for method. And there is an A1 mark when you say increased. This is A1. So the tricky thing about M1, A1 pairs is you must get the M1, only you can get the A1 mark. So if I just simply say, uh, increase, without explanation, I may not be able to get this A1 mark. Set. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's the end of this projectile question. What's GPE? Uh? Uh, GPE is mm, depending on how high you are. So throw back to GPE. Uh, where should I write my GPE? GPE is related to MGH. Down here. Means the higher you are, the more GPE you have. So if you're really high up here, uh, this is the highest GPE. Gravitational potential energy. All the way at the bottom, at the end, this is where you have a low GPE. Yeah, so that's down here. So if you're high up, you have a lot of potential energy. Potential to do what? Uh? Potential to move. Take your water bottle, move it really high up, and let go. Take your phone, put it really high up, and let go. Potential to crack. So, just depending on where you position the mass, you will have GPE. Okay. Yeah, I think this paper is a bit... Mm, there, are, there are some definitely some traps here. Just now in the first part of the stream, we looked at the Great Threshold. It was lower than the other two variants, so I, so I would say this might be more tricky than the other two. P21 and P22. Okay. Let's continue to the next question. This is for drag force and graphs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Here we go. This one is quite new. Didn't see this type of uh, graph question before. Define velocity. Okay, so velocity is how quickly your displacement is changing. Also known as rate of change of displacement. Personally, I would recommend you write rate of change of displacement. Alternatively, the mouse scheme also mentions that you can also say change in displacement over time. Sure, but I personally prefer the first one because it's a bit more mathematically accurate. And once in a while, the mouse scheme very strict. They want to see you mention the rate. So I don't know, up to you. So let's look at the question. A constant driving force of 2,400x on the car of a mass. Car accelerates from rest. Assume that there's no resistive forces. Calculate the acceleration of the car. So all the force questions, my only tip for you is to just draw a free body diagram. So what's the object? The car. What's the forces on the object? Uh, driving force? 
Yeah. So we draw a driving force, 2,400 Newton. Okay, and this car is moving lah, at some speed, getting faster and faster. It's going to be some acceleration due to the 2,400. So we go Newton's second law. Okay, force, mass, acceleration means we got to go Newton's second law. So F equals to MA. 2,400. How heavy? 1,200. And acceleration. So here we get 2. Now don't be so happy and write 2 here because there's a chance you may lose some points. You need to remember to put final answers in 2 significant figures. So 2SF. At least. Okay, so remember the point zero, if you forgot the point zero. So one mark for a final answer. Okay. Here's where it gets a bit challenging. So on the graph, sketch uh, on sketch a graph showing the variation of the velocity of the car for the first 20 seconds of its motion. So we are starting from rest. Yeah, up here, the question says from rest all the way up there. So whatever velocity I draw here, I need to start from the zero velocity, which is all the way at the bottom down here. Then, if acceleration is constant, 2.0, it should be a straight line. Something like that. Ooh, that's not really a straight line, but you know, straight line. But don't just simply straight line anywhere. We straight line though, it's good to know that after 20 seconds, what should be the velocity? Let's do a quick calculation to double check since this is a two mark question so we probably should do proper values huh? okay so i know i know my graph is going to start at zero zero i need to find the final velocity so after 20 seconds acceleration is change in velocity over time interval so this acceleration is two i don't know the v we start off at rest so no initial speed and we take 20 seconds to get faster and faster. Okay, so this should be 40 uh, meters per second. Means as I get faster and faster, by 20 seconds, I should be at 40. So I'm going to plot an X there. Small little X right here. Okay, so on your paper, you try to draw a straight line. I will attempt. But this one note. Kind of does some weird stuff sometimes. Okay, okay, almost there, almost there, almost there, almost there. Uh -huh. And we got it. Okay, perfect. So this is our graph A. Oh, mass label. Uh. Sometimes you don't label, you might lose a point as well. So this is A. Next graph. Oh, wait. How many marks is this? Two marks. So one mark comes if you have a straight line from the origin. So straight line, origin. Another mark comes from where did your graph end? So the graph ends at the point uh, 20 seconds later, you are at 40 meters per second. So yeah, start and end. Next, in reality, expectation versus reality. A resistive force due to air resistance acts on the car. This resistive force increases with speed until it becomes equal in magnitude to the driving force at time t12 so there's a very important sentence here something happens at 12 seconds what is it uh equal in magnitude to driving force so let's go back to our car diagram uh. <laughs> what was it just now uh yes this one okay so let's let me draw the story for you uh. The car starts off like this with some force. Okay, now we have to include air resistance, 2400. Then there will be this resistive force that is slowly increasing as the car gets faster and faster. So increasing with speed. So the car is moving to the right. Until eventually, many seconds later, you reach a point where the forward 2,400 driving force is exactly the same as a resistive force 2,400. <gasps> Does this mean the car stopped moving? 
no 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 car is still moving but this speed is now constant also known as terminal velocity because the force cancel out there is no more acceleration so here no acceleration whereas just now you have acceleration getting faster so your speed is increasing okay how do we plot this so the key word is at 12 something happens we reach terminal velocity so i should draw a straight line at 12 wherever it is lah now before that though it cannot be a straight line anymore it has to be a curve so i'm gonna try attempt to draw the best i can so you should have a curve ah curve and then once you hit 12 the gradient should be zero no more acceleration so constant speed so you try to draw a straight line best you can here so here is where you have constant terminal velocity can't go any faster because there is no acceleration because the forces cancel out okay so this is your graph b i think they want us to label it right label this line b okay yes please label the line b so let's go b so how to check if your graph is correct according to the mark scheme firstly i need a line from origin so beneath okay so this line from origin because you start from rest has to be below your other graph a so this this graph a is here whatever you draw should be below huh? doesn't matter how low or how high as long as it's below secondly Oh, this is, sorry, this is B1 mark. Independent mark. Then your gradient have to slowly decrease until zero. So that means, you see here, eventually the graph become flat. Here is where the gradient is zero. So the gradient, which is acceleration, is zero. Last mark. Uh, the graph should be horizontal. Okay, horizontal here means constant speed. Huh? 12 seconds onwards. So at T12 onwards. The nice thing is we don't need to know exactly what is the terminal speed. Yeah, so we don't have enough information to calculate that also. So we just, they're happy, whatever value it is. If you draw it uh, like I did, or if you drew it a little lower here, or if you drew it a little higher here, it's okay. We don't know the value. Okay, so as long as you satisfy these three criteria, you get the three marks for drawing a graph. Okay, let's go on to the next part. So that's sketching. Okay, now we gotta explain. Okay, let's go. So at time t20, you change something else. The driving force is increased to 3000 and then remains constant. Describe how the velocity of the car changes due to this increase in driving force. Oh, okay. Let's... So just now, we already have a story, right? Your car is getting faster and faster. Then you reach terminal velocity. 2400, 2400. Let's continue the story. What if... I'm gonna copy and paste this. So I'm lazy to redraw. <laughs> so okay here's a story this was at uh 12 seconds let me label that t12 okay t20 our driver decides to make things a little interesting so here we got 3000 newton oh my goodness i think i need more space 3000 and we are still having a 2,400 resistive force. Okay, now you see the force is not balanced, right? This forward force is much bigger than the backwards force. Means there's going to be some acceleration happening here. So forward acceleration. Acceleration. Which means whatever speed you have will be increasing again. Because there is acceleration. In the same direction as speed okay so we're getting faster it's t20 but eventually though as you get faster this resistive force also get bigger 
Mm. So after some time, you also reach terminal velocity where you have 3,000 Newton. And this resistive force has gotten bigger to also 3,000 Newton. And now your acceleration is zero. There is no more net force. This one cancel out this one. So whatever velocity you have, yeah, you're moving to the right, but now it's going to be constant. Right. So how do we explain this in English? So we can say that, you want to describe, tell a story. What's a story? How the velocity changes. So we say at first it is constant, then 20 seconds it increases. So we say velocity will increase due to acceleration. Due to acceleration. Because now we have a big driving force, 3,000. But it will eventually become constant. So it's so increase until it reaches a new or higher terminal velocity. Terminal velocity that is constant. The side note to yourself, this is constant. No more acceleration. That's this diagram on the right. So if you can draw this diagram and tell a story based on the diagram and draw a graph, that would be great. Help you understand kinematics. Okay, so if you mentioned increase, that's a mark. Uh, increase until you reach another terminal velocity or constant velocity or another speed. You can check the mask scheme for different ways of saying this. Uh, except if you use the word speed, then that's the other second mark. So you know, for fun, if you were to extend the graph of this story from T20 onwards, <laughs> how would it look like? Huh? Let's go back to this one here. Okay, so your graph increase, increase, flat. You're probably going to go up and then kind of hit another terminal velocity like that. <laughs> it's a very weird graph. But if you ever have to draw it, you should know how to explain why the graph looks like that. Okay. But yeah, I think that's all for this terminal velocity question. Pretty good one. Explain, calculate, draw graph. Okay, next. No further questions for this one. Okay, we continue. Huh? Now we go to energy chapter. Fun fact, did you know that the questions are arranged by chapter? Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can roughly guess, most of the time, it's according to chapter sequence. Give me a moment. <coughs> okay. Let's do this energy. A mass M moves a vertical distance delta H in a uniform gravitational field and gains gravitational potential energy. The acceleration of free fall is G. Use a concept of work done to show that you have this equation, mgh. Okay. So that means, um, if you're in, let's say in planet Earth, we are in this thing called a gravitational field that is uniform. So if I were to draw the field lines of the Earth, it kind of looks like that. So if you have an object in the field, there will be a force acting on the object. We call this weight. And we use the symbol, uh, we calculate it with m times g. So that's the force acting on the object, a mass. So if you have to prove this, let's think of concept of work done. Work done, we use it as force times distance, right? Force times distance. What's the force here? Weight. So I just say, oh, mg. What's the distance? Uh, if I move an object from, let's say, here, all the way to the ground, that's a change in height. So that's delta H. Okay, so work done is a change in energy. So I'm going to do one more line and say, uh, since work done is a change in gravitational potential energy, therefore I can say change in EP is mg delta H. Okay. So M1 is, if you write down somewhere, you know why it's work done. And then you 
show that, okay, work done is changed in GPE, I get to this conclusion, that's A1. So all the, most of the energy equation, you can derive it from work done. Make sure you know how to do that. Okay. So here's a, mm, a generator machine. A 60 gram, a 60 kg mass attached to a string wrapped around the wheel of a generator. So this is a wheel here, can turn, turn, turn one. The mass is held above the floor. When released, the mass accelerates and then fall at a steady speed. So as this mass go down, the wheel will start to turn. Generator will start to generate electricity. Goes through the circuit. Okay, air resistance is negligible. All right. So state the main energy change when the mass is falling at a steady speed. Key note here is steady speed. So the mass is going from high up to lower down. That's a change in gravitational potential energy. Because you go from a high place, drop all the way to a lower place. But what energy is it converted to though? Hmm, kinetic energy? Hmm, actually, normally yes, object fall from high to low. But in this case, steady speed, steady speed. So there is no change in kinetic energy. So we, that's not the main change. Normally we say change to Ke. No, something else. You say, means electrical energy in the circuit. Possible, but I think what they are looking for is the final change. So yes, there's electricity involved, but at the end of the day, it's the resistor here that will release some heat. It gets very hot when current flow through it. So that's some kind of energy loss there. So we're going to say heat or thermal energy. Heat or thermal energy. I know this point is a bit debatable. You might argue, miss, electrical energy, so cute. Mark scheme somehow is picky and they chose heat thermal energy. Okay, so that's one first part. Just see the, looking at the energy changes here. After that though, they have to do calculation. Ooh, that involves circuits. <laughs> so when falling at a steady speed, the mass falls through a vertical distance causes current in the resistor. Resistance is given. Calculate the rate of work done by the falling mass. Rate of work done. Uh, I think we gotta say hmm, rate work done. When you see the word rate, think of work done per time. Which also happens to be power. Power is, you know, change in energy over time. So let's calculate for the falling mass. So we're going to look at power, uh, which is our mg change in height over t. So let's go mass. Okay, you dig on the mass. What's the mass? What's the mass? Um, did they give us the mass? Ah, they did. Right up here. 60, uh, sorry, 0 0.6 kg mass. So let's go 0 0.6, 9.81. Height. Height? Height? This is 1.4 meters. Okay, good. Time. In a time of 4 seconds. So, find the average power over the 4 seconds. Okay, so this should give us about 2.06 watts. Or you could write as 2.1 watts. That's this final answer. Okay, the other mark comes from equation of rate of work done, if you know what that means. Alternatively, there's another method you can write this out, which is force times velocity, or in other words, mg times distance over time, which is the same thing, lah, mgh over t. Okay, lah. But just FYI, you can also use this method. Okay, so the mass is going down. The There's also power in the circuit, dissipated in the resistor. So if I were to draw the resistor like that, why is there power dissipated again? Oh, because there's current. So there's some current, 90 milliamps going through the resistor, and that causes it to get hot. So energy coming out at a certain rate. Resistance, 47 ohm. 
So if I have R and I have I, the best choice I can use to calculate power is then I square R for this one resistor here. So I'm going to go and write 90 milliamps. Milli is the 10 negative 3 right here. Square. Then 47. Oh. This will give me a value of 0 0.3807 as my power dissipated. So that's right here, 0 0.38. Okay, last part. Efficiency of the generator. Hmm, so if there's part 1, 2, 3, there's a chance it's, res it's related. But how do I find the efficiency? Hmm. So efficiency, I use this symbol eta, e efficiency. We need to use the power output of the generator over the power input of the generator. Um, and you can do it in percentage or in fraction. So let's do the fraction. So what's the power coming out of the generator? I think, I think I'm going to draw a diagram here because there's a lot of energy changes that we mentioned here just now. So first things first, the mass drop down and that moves the generator. So I'm going to write here, generator. This is one machine. What energy goes in? Your MGH. Okay, so this is your GPE. There's some power input. Then the generator will move the circuit, right? So we've got some electrical energy coming out. Okay. And that kind of does another energy change inside the resistor. So two machines, if you want to call it that. But here, okay, is electrical energy. Which is what comes out of the generator. Okay, then of course resistor eventually convert to heat, lah, heat energy. So we want to see the efficiency of this part right here highlighted. So we're going to use what comes out, which is electrical energy, 0 0.38. Power in, which is the GPE we just calculated just now, 2.1. And this one we can, okay, lah, do percentage, lah, so times 100 times 100, we should get about 18.09 or 18%. Please write your percent because they never give you the units. Right, so one mark is for final answer. One mark is for the equation of efficiency, especially power out over power in. It's a ratio. Okay, mm, I think that's all. Okay, yeah, so that's all for this question of energies. How do you calculate power and energy? Conversion system. Hello, hello. Loading. Okay, this is oh, this is such a weird waves question. This one is new. I don't think I have seen a passage that talks about intensity and power like this. So, may have caught some people off guard when they were doing this paper. Hmm. Okay, let's continue. Question 5. Parallel light rays from the sun are incident normally on a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass directs the light to an area of radius, tiny, tiny radius. If you've never played with a magnifying glass before, please do so. Find a hot day, go outside, and make the magnifying glass focus all the sunlight on a tiny, tiny spot. For example, an ant, I don't know, or something that you want to burn. Okay, and then you will see the poor insect just fizzle, burn, and explode. <laughs> okay, anyway, what are we doing here? So the tells magnifying glass, we got cross section, radius, intensity of the sun on the magnifying glass is 1.3. So this whole part here is incoming rays from the sun. It's 1.3 kilowatts per meter. What does that mean? I don't know. We'll find out. Calculate the power of the light from the sun incident on the magnifying glass. So intensity here is 1.3 kilowatt per meter. What power is this though? It really depends on the area of this lens, this round lens. And the equation here, which is actually in the waves chapter, is the intensity 
is power per unit area power over area okay there we go so if you all know the intensity is 1.3 let's write that down power you don't know area what's the area of our lens uh, circular in cross section okay so we need an area probably pi r squared with the radius given okay 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 so we go pi r um please convert your cm okay so times 10 negative 2 cm squared so power at the end of the day should be 12.354 or 12 watts rounded to 2 sf so one mark is for final answer one mark for is for this very important equation not very popular in past year it's making one of the rare appearances in paper two uh this is c1 for the equation all right so that's for the magnifying glass part now they want us to calculate the intensity of the light on the area a which is the small little area there so maybe the intensity here is like ah uh, it's kind of okay by the time you focus all the lens all that energy into one tiny spot ooh, it's so hot you could start a fire but it's like a laser beam almost so we use the same equation again intensity power over area but it's the same hmm, power ah. power of the light so intensity will change power is the same so we can use the 12 watts area we go pi r square again but this time for a very much smaller radius so 1.5 times 10 negative 3 square okay so this one will be a very random number 1697652 or round it off standard form please 1.7 uh, how many what power is this huh? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, dot Okay, 1.7 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so this is one mark just for the final answer. Wow, that's many times more. Beginning here is 1.3 times 10 to the 3. Now when you focus all that energy, it becomes 1.7 times 10 to the 6. No wonder the ends will be fried. If you focus the light on them. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, a laser beam. Oh, so now we change the story. We're looking at the laser beam now. We have an electromagnetic wave of certain frequency in a vacuum. Show that the wavelength is this. So you see the lambda? You see the F? We need an equation that got F and lambda. So that's going to be V equals to F lambda. What is the speed of an electromagnetic wave though? The speed is a constant. We call it C, which is the speed of light 3 times 10 to the power of 8. It's given in the data formula sheet, so if you can't memorize it, you should know where to find it. So 3 times 10 about 8. Frequency 3.7 times 10 to the 15. And wavelength. We just need to show that we can get this answer. <laughs> so, we just, so press the calculator, you should get about 8.108 times 10 negative 8 okay so you show that you know this equation write it out v equals f lambda then you submit values to get final answer ah this is the final mark lah. so what's the region of this electromagnetic spectrum for this wave uh this you kind of have to memorize the wavelength of the main regions personally i memorize them in nanometers which is 10 to the negative 9. So this is about 81 nanometers. And then I kind of memorize the visible light range. So let's draw a visible light range. Violet. Okay, so red color wavelength is about 700 nanometers. Okay, shorter and shorter, shorter, shorter until violet. This is about 400 nanometers. This is red, 
violet. This is the visible light range. So this 81 uh, is really kind of smaller on this end. So what's smaller than violet? Ultraviolet. What's longer than, inf than red? Infrared. That's like 1,000 or few thousand nanometers. So I'm just going with ultraviolet. We'll go with ultraviolet. Okay, so ultraviolet. So go memorize the electromagnetic spectrum, the numbers, uh, at least the wavelength or frequency. Okay, next. So they change topic again. Uh, not change topic. We do something else with this laser. So the beam from the laser now passes through a diffraction grating. 2,400 lines per millimeter. Okay, so we have a detector that will go in the arc to detect the maxima. These are called the bright fringes produced by the waves. So bright fringes is like, you know, laser light come in, pew, 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 pew. At these spots, you will see a very bright laser light. At other spots, it doesn't exist. Okay, so this is an example. Okay, what do they want us to find though? Mm. Calculate the number of maxima detected as the detector moves through 180 along the line. Wow, okay. Number of maxima detected in total. So this is in total. So if you're not sure where to start, the first thing is we think of diffraction grating has an equation. We should write it down first. So n lambda is d sine theta. What is all this num what 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 what's all these alphabets for? Okay. So n here is the, 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 the order of maxima. For example, the middle maxima is called n0. The next one is n1. The next one is n2. Eventually you kind of hit the limit. You can't go beyond you can't go backwards. So your limit is this angle here. The biggest maxima you can have. So if we can find out what is the biggest number n, uh, then I think we can know how many maxima there will be in total that's detected. So for this, let's think about it. What's the maximum angle we can have? I think you should be less than 90 degrees because you don't want the, the, the n's to go backwards, right? The maxima can't go backwards. So the limit of theta is 90 degrees. Let's write that down. This Hmm. The theta maximum is 90 degrees. Or I should say it should be less than 90 degrees. So n value, whatever that is, for the wavelength, which is 80 or 8.1 times 10 negative 8, for a grating of d, what is d? Ooh, D is a property of the grating itself. So diffraction, diffraction grating kind of looks like a slide, like this, a piece of glass. And a machine will cut the glass to make a lot of holes, like this. Many, 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 many small lines that you cannot even see with your eyes. Okay. The hint here is this 2,400 lines per millimeter tells the hint for the D value. So D value here means in one millimeter, you cut into 2,400 lines. This is your D. Okay, it should be in a unit of meters uh, length. So this is what we're going to plug into the equation. In one millimeter of this glass piece, you cut 2,400 vertical lines. Okay, so let's plug this value in the equation. So let's go, we got one millimeter cut into 2,400. And the sign here, we're going to put sign 90. Yeah, that's our maximum right here. So you should get an uh, end value of 5.144. Uh, but these end values should be whole numbers. So I'm going to round it off and say, therefore, the maximum or the highest n number is going to be 5. We cannot reach 6 yet. 5.1 is not quite 6, so we got to round down to the nearest whole number. Okay. Uh, 
In other words, you could also an alternative alternative way of writing this part out is to say your n lambda should be less than d sine ninety, which is one. So n should be less than d over lambda. So when we get n less than five point one four four, you just gotta go down to the next whole number five. So this whole number only. So is the answer five? Wrong. Not yet. We are not done yet. Patience. This is the highest n number, which means to go back to this. We have hmm, n zero is the middle one. Oh yeah, I'm gonna use a thinner one. This is n zero. Then there is one, two, three, four, five. So this is n one, n two, n three, n four, n five. So the detector should detect like I don't know six already here. Hey, but don't forget the other side also got. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so here is n equals to one, n equals to two, n equals to three, n equals to four, n equals to five. How many in total? You go and count all the lines. Ah, uh. one, two, three, four, five, seven. So it should be eleven in total. Five on each side. Don't forget the middle one as well. So nice fan. So let's write it down. So in total, you got five on each side, and don't forget the middle n equals zero. So this total is eleven maxima that you will see, uh, by the detector. So eleven. <laughs> so tricky. So, one mark for your equation here, C1. One mark for your diffraction grating. You know what the D is. This is V1. Sorry, C1. Then if you get your 5.1, find your correct values, it's B1. And then you remember that, oh wait, I want the total in how many in total? Oh, that's the final one, A1. One, two, three, four. Four marks. Wow. So quite a big question. Okay, let's continue on. So now we change the laser with a wavelength of 300 nanometers now. It's a slightly different wavelength. What was the wavelength just now again? 81. So we go from 81 nanometers to 300 nanometers. Okay. What do you want me to do? Explain. Without calculation. What happens to the number of maxima now detected? Assume the detector is also sensitive to the wavelength of electromagnetic waves. So we need to think of how the, the, the largest n number change, right? Just now we say the largest was five. If we change the wavelength, how will this n number change? So I'm gonna use this idea here, same concept. Okay. We go with uh, n lambda d sine theta. But I want to look for what happens if I want to look at sine 90. Okay, Whatever angle it is has to be less than sine 90. So whatever n value will be related by this kind of relationship, d and lambda. So if I change my wavelength, this wavelength is getting longer. So my wavelength increase. So when this lambda increase, if I assume the d is constant, then n is proportional to 1 over lambda. So lambda increase, n will decrease. Mm. So there is less maxima in total. So I'm going to write here in English, the maximum n has decreased. Can't go until n equals to 5 like just now. So there's less maxima in total. So how to explain now? Uh? Mm, okay. Two bucks. We need to explain. Alright. Uh, so we can say... Mm, number of maxima. So I'm going to start with that. So the number of maxima detected... Decreases. Why uh, must explain. 
Oh, uh, uh, because, because, because the wavelength decrease. Decreases. Now, if you want to be a bit extra, you could also list this out uh, as you're working at the bottom. Just kind of, you know, just FYI. N proportional to 1 over lambda. You kind of you can mention that if you want to. Just extra bonus. But here, uh, if you mention wavelength decrease, that's your method, ma. And then you say the number maxima therefore decreases. That's your A1. Now, tricky thing about M1, A1 is you must get the M1 in order to also get the A1. They are linked. If you didn't mention M1, you cannot get the A1. Okay. So that's this uh, maxima question. I have a simulation I can click on to show you in a bit. In a second. Mm. Ah, yes, this diffraction grating lab. So wavelength increase, right? Yeah, all right? Give this computer a second to wake up. Come on, computer, you can do this. Full screen. Ah. All right. So in case you haven't seen this experiment before, um, this is what happens if you have a laser down here, shoots a light at the screen. If I put this diffraction grating in the path of the laser, ta-da, I get this. So you see how all these maxima are spread out? And you see these white dots, or white dots, green dots? These are the ones you can see. So what happens is if I increase the wavelength, they get further apart, and consequently they are less maxima that can fit into this mm, 90 degree area la, okay they can't go backwards so <laughs> if i decrease the wavelength there's just more of these look at look so many okay so this is what it means when you see the equation this is what it looks like in real life if you could see it okay so hopefully that's helpful you're helping to visualize a little bit on what's what's a physical thing happening behind the equations but yeah, that's all for this question. Next. Mm. Alright, back to this. No other questions for this one? Okay, never mind. Let's continue. Okay, this circuit question. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's go. IV characteristic. Mm. On this figure, sketch the IV characteristic of a filament lamp. It's a filament lamp. It's what we call the light bulb. The one where, you know, got a screw here, got a glass here, and then there's some kind of wire inside there. And this wire is a thing that glows very bright that causes the whole bulb to kind of light up. So this one, you got to memorize the shape of a characteristic curve for I against V. It's going to be shaped like this and then doesn't flatten out right? just gets less steep here symmetrical less steep but not flat not horizontal at least huh? no 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 just get less steep okay should be symmetrical so whatever graph you draw um some key notes is that firstly it should be in the positive quadrant and this negative negative quadrant negative v negative i and it should be symmetrical so first one, correct quadrants. That's your M1 mark. Quadrants. And you must pass through origin. Secondly, uh, look out for the gradient. Should be the correct gradient. It should start off pretty steep. Then the gradient should eventually decrease. See the slope is getting more flat. It's this way, flat. So that's for decreasing gradient and the graph must be symmetrical for the right side and the left side as well Let's try to draw the best you can to this kind of shape okay so what next we need to explain the shape of the line in a1 explain uh, why like that uh? you go check out the electricity videos there are some facts we need to know about filament lamps the first one is what hap how does it even glow when electricity goes through the filament? See, I draw little arrows here to represent current flowing through the filament. It gets hot. If you ever touch a bulb like this, it's hot. <laughs> so we say, as the current 
increases. <coughs> the temperature of the filament increases. Very hot! <coughs> so, <coughs> imagine a piece of wire. <coughs> Your electron is trying to go through the wire. But when it gets hot, the atoms of the wire, they all start vibrating. So there's also a lot of other stuff inside. There's atom, 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 atom. There's also electrons. All the atoms all start vibrating. and It's very excited. It's very hot. It's very hot inside here. So your poor electron is like, excuse me, I want to pass through. And all these people just dancing and vibrating around. So a lot of resistance. It's like you trying to walk through a dance party. Everyone is just dancing and you're just like, I just want to get to the end of this tunnel. Just, just, just let me pass. A lot of resistance. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what happens here. But don't write it like that. Write in English physics terms. <coughs> so we say, so the resistance of the lamp. Ah, because atoms are vibrating. They, they kind of like hinder the electrons from passing through nicely. So the resistance of lamp increases in the wire lah. okay and when there's resistance the ratio of this graph will change <coughs> so and the ratio of v over i will increase this is where the graph curves come from because v equals i r that's ohm's law right so resistance is v over i ratio okay uh, yeah, I think that's how that's all we can mention here. So these three points is B1. So B1, B1, B1. Talk about how your filament, uh, how current or voltage affects your temperature. Temperature then is linked to resistance. Everybody's hot, everybody is like vibrating inside the wire. And then resistance then is related to the ratio of V over I. Not the gradient on the graph, uh, ratio of V over I. Okay, next. So conducting wire has length 5.8 meters and a cross-section area A. Uh, let's just label this so we see maybe what equation we can use. Cross-section area A. Resistivity? Rho. Rho L and A. Mm, this reminds me of the resistivity equation of a wire. How do you know the resistance? You can calculate it. It's great, they gave us the value. So let's go. Uh, resistivity, 5.6 times 10, negative 8. L is 5.8. Area is 3.4 times 10, negative 8. Everybody is in SI units, right? Just double check. Meters, 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 meters. Okay, it's good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so this one should be 9.5529, roughly 9.6. So you check your answer, you should get about 9.6, that's your final work, accuracy mark. Now if you wrote the equation down though, that's very important to always start by writing out the equation first before you put in all the numbers, because then I can clearly see, okay, you know the equation, I can give you a mark, C1. Now if you did not write this equation and just throw numbers here, I have to guess that I think you know the equation. But if any one of these numbers are wrong, then I'm like, I have no idea what you're doing. That's what? What? No idea. So, to be safe, write equation first. Safer, safer. Okay, last part of this circuit question. Oh, this one is where we get things get interesting. Circuit analysis. Circuit changes. Ah, yes. So, a resistor of resistance is placed in a circuit with negligible internal resistance. Fantastic. Uh, two switches and three emitters. Circuit is shown. The reading on X is 1A when S1 is open and S2 is closed. So I'm going to get very confused. So I'm going to draw it out. S1 is open. S2 is closed. So I need to close. Okay, okay. Close. So current will flow like this. Or I could just, I could just highlight it. Nah, this is the path of electric current. Okay, so what do we have here? We need to complete the table, right? Mm. 
Okay, so the first one, S1 is open, S2 is closed. What's the reading on X? We got current, 1 amp. Reading on Y. Is there any electricity flowing through this Y? Would I have, right? Electricity will only, f electric current will only flow in a complete path. So there's a dead end here. There's not going to be any current. So I'm just going to go with zero. Reading on Z. So the current didn't split up anywhere. There's no junctions. So if it's 1 amp here, the same amount, 1 amp, will also be flowing through this. So it's all go with 1. Okay, that's, that's how we can think of current. Part 2. S1 is closed. S2 is open. Okay, time to change the diagram. S1 closed, S2 open. So, hmm... S1 is closed, means now current will flow through S1 and then go back. Hmm, did they give us any... Oh, it's all blank. Okay, okay. The one I definitely know is z there's no current going through the Z emitter now. So Z is going to be zero. So I'm going to put that because I'm very sure of that. Zero. But what about these two though? X and Y. Is it also 1? Let's think about it for a moment. Hmm. Just now, when, 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 when we had this resistance R, the current was 1 amps. Okay, uh, let's just say this EMF is 10 volts. Uh. This 10 volts is still the same value across both resistors. So let's say 10. Now, if current, oh sorry, current going through 2R just now was 1M, now the scenario has changed a bit where the current is going through R. And it's still the same 10 volts. So it's impossible that this current should also be 1M because look! The resistance is 2R. Now the resistance is lesser by half. So, mm, if I think of my Ohm's law, V equals to I R. Well, for this resistor at least. Assuming the voltage is the same because these two are in parallel with the same battery, my R and I are inversely proportional. So I is inversely proportional to R. So if my resistance becomes two times smaller, my current should be two times bigger. Two times bigger means double. See this one? Big resistance, small current. Small resistance, big current. Okay, so we got two amps. So I'm gonna write two amps. Flowing through this whole circuit now. Two amps. Okay, so we go two. And two. Both should be two. Why are both two? Ah, uh, uh, here are two amps going through A. Same path, two amps going through here. Okay, okay. Last part, you close S, you also close S, both switch is closed. Okay, so that means I got to redraw my circuit once again. Let's draw it. Dun, 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 dun. Close this switch. Close this switch. Ooh, now the current will flow to here. Split, one goes up, one goes down. And then eventually join back and then go back to the circuit. Mm, so there should be readings in everything now. But how does the current change? Moment of thinking. Okay, this is just now that's number two. Okay, this is number three. Let's do the same thing again. Mm. So 2R. Uh, resistor R. And resistor 2R. They still have the same 10 volts flowing through them. They both have the same 10 volts flowing through them. Uh, which means they should have the same current. Which means... Uh, wait, wait, wait. See, uh, 10 volts for R. 10 volts for R. So it should be 2R. 2M, sorry. When you have 10 volts, you have 2 amps. Okay. This one though, 10 volts and 2R. <clears throat> This one is a throwback to our very first scenario here. When you have two, when you open switch one and close switch two, 
here we had one vote going through the meter Z and meter X so it should be one vote one amp sorry this is from the earlier scenario which I didn't draw out okay so in total because battery is still 10 volts for R we have 2 amps for 2R we have 1 amps higher resistance lower current okay check but it means when they join together they should be 3 amps or in the first place 3 amps is coming in then the 3 amps will split 2 amps go up 1 amp go down oh we need to write this down so it's complicated so reading on x we have 3 amps coming in y will take 2 amps for that part and Z will have 1 amp. So 2 plus 1 should equal to 3. <laughs> this is a tricky question. Okay, so that's how we can think of it. And you say, oh miss, the total circuit current increase uh, become 3 when you close all the switch. Yeah, it can happen like that. If you're wondering why and you're not convinced, here's a tip. When you close both switches, you're using both resistors. So the total resistance of the whole circuit actually decrease. If you're wondering why, oh well, let's add together resistance. So there's one, there's an R, and there's a two R. So if I add them in parallel, this will be three over two R, okay? Or in other words, two over three times R. Okay, so just now when we activated, only one was closed. We only activate one resistor. Here we only activate one resistor. The first one, we close S2 is well. 2R. Okay, so this one only the 2R resistor is used. For S1, only the R resistor is used. But when you close both, wow, your total resistance is only 2 over 3R. So total current should be increased. So that's why we go to 3, oh, uh, 3 amps in total. Okay, so how do you get these four marks? First one is this row both correct. Next one, all three correct for the next row. Next one, this x value is y plus z. That's one mark. And if all values correct for the last row, then that's the final b1 mark. Oh, this is tricky. So to understand this circuit um, changes a bit better, I recommend you try out building a circuit in real life. Or if you find that it's quite impossible, do check out the simulation link over here. I'm going to post it in the chat also. So, I mean, you can Google. Google is your best friend. Or you could try it out yourself also. Give me a second. To load it. Loading, loading. Okay, click on lab. <coughs> the paper is already released though. I think you'll be able to Google it. <coughs> yeah, you should be able to find it in most past year paper sites. Okay, so this link um is a DC circuit construction kit by FET, P-H-E-T. Very nice, just Google DC construction kit, it'll probably bring you there. So here, you can try to construct the circuit, like legit, like actually construct the circuit. Okay, give me a second to construct. Put a battery here. We put a resistor here, and another resistor here. There's two switches. Switch, switch. Okay, and then we put an emitter, right? Okay, we need to put emitter. We're going to call this the main emitter before we split up. Then you connect some nice wires. I'm just going to be lazy and just put them all like that. Come here a bit. Yeah, that's how I like it. That's how I like it. Notice how the electrons are already in the wires. That's where the electron comes from. They are already in the wires. Okay, so I guess the R value is fine. We'll take away the 
values. I don't want to see the current. Okay, let's give this circuit a 10 ohm and double this one. So let's give it a 20 ohm. 310. Okay, and we ready. Let's close some switches. Okay, so let's so we go back to our question just now. We close the S2 switch. Okay, there should be current now flowing inside here. You can see the current moving literally. And you got a current here. You can also experiment by using this current meter <laughs> to measure the current flowing through this lower resistor. 0 0.45. See? Should be the same. What goes through here is just one loop. Alright. The other one we did was we close the first switch. Okay, so if this one is 0 0.9, it should also be 0 0.9 because look, current is just flowing through that same loop. What if we close both switches? Ah. So you have current that is going to split right here. Some of them will go through the first resistor, some of them will go down. And if this current is 1.35, this one is higher resistors, it should have a lower current. So 0 0.45 only. The other one, 0 0.9, double. 0 0.45 times 2 is 0 0.9. So if your resistance is half, your current is double. Okay, so go literally like play around with this experiment. You could drag as many current meters as you want to just see. Until you can explain and understand with equations, diagrams, and make physical sense of it. Okay, but I think that's all for this question. There's a lot of changes in circuits. They need to think through very carefully. Okay, that's all. Next question. Final question. Oh, finally we are done. Oh, we didn't take two hours. Nice. Okay. Back to this. Ooh, this is particle physics. This is a very weird chapter. Very interesting though. Because we haven't really fully discovered the end of particle physics yet. We are still discovering new stuff. Even as we are taking our exams today. But they're not gonna... They won't update our textbooks. Don't worry. Maybe your grandchildren will have to study more things. Okay, <clears throat> let's finish this. Fluorine 18 is an isotope that decays to an isotope of oxygen by the emission of a beta plus particle. Complete the nuclear equation for this decay, including all the particles involved. Okay, this kind of feels like chemistry, but it's also physics. So let's look at the process. So decays to oxygen. So I'm just going to write here oxygen. And you say, Miss, I don't remember oxygen got how many protons. I don't take chemistry. It's okay. We will find out other ways to think of that. So what we do know this is in physics, you need to know what is a beta particle, beta plus to be specific. It's basically a positive electron. So beta plus particle, they have a, they have a, a, a particular nucleon and proton number that you need to include in these kind of reactions. So it's a plus one and a zero. So then you can work backwards. What plus 1 is 9? 8, no? 8 plus 1 is 9. Alright. Plus 0 should be 18, so there should be no change. So that's your oxygen isotope. Okay, uh, we are missing something though. For beta decays, you need to also include this thing called an anti-neutrino. So you can write uh, this symbol, gamma. Or you could mention the word uh, neutrino. Not anti-neutrino, oh, sorry, just neutrino. Uh, you do not have to write the nuclear and proton number because it's zero, 0, but if you want to, sure. You won't be deducted marks for it, so I'm going to put this in brackets. Okay, so three marks, wow. Mm. One for oxygen, one for beta. If you didn't put the negative, uh, sorry, if you didn't put the positive, that's okay. And one for your neutrino. Either the symbol or the word of it. So, why, how this fluorine can suddenly become oxygen? Uh, it's because in this fluorine nucleus, a quark changes flavor. Oh, I like this physics term. Changes flavor during the decay. What is this change of flavor? So, you notice what's different between the fluorine and oxygen? 
is this proton number. Somehow, the proton number has decreased by 1. But the nucleon number remains the same. So what you need to know is, during a beta decay, beta plus decay, in the nucleus of fluorine, a proton actually transforms into a neutron because of a flavor change. <laughs> the flavor here actually refers to the quark flavor. So a proton, inside a proton, you can break into three. Proton got three friends. It is called, they have the names up, up, and down. So this will be like U, U, and D. A neutron is up, down, down. So who is the flavor that changed? You see the flavor? This one, one of the up quark became a down quark. So that's the flavor change. So we say up quark to down quark. That's the flavor. These are called flavors. So B1. Okay, next part. A hadron has a charge of 2E and negative 2E. State and explain whether the hadron is a meson or a baryon. Oh my goodness, all these terms. Uh, so a quick note, revision also. What, what, what are these terms? These are like classification names. Uh, you know, you have like animal kingdom, plant kingdom. But in physics, we go particle kingdom. In the hadron kingdom though, there is two classes. One is a baryon class. One is a meson class. Actually, I'm going to write it aside. I need more space for this. Okay, Hadron Kingdom. Just type a particle, a group of particles. Mesons or mesons are the particles that have two quarks inside of them. Two friends. Baryons are the particles that have three quarks inside of them, held together, and they form a particle by themselves. Okay, so this Hadron is just a name for... Particles that are made out of smaller particles, quarks. So, back to this, how do we know? Hmm. You need to think of what are the combination of quarks that can give 2E. So, for example, back to this, uh, let's look at the up quark and down quark. So, up quark up, has a charge of 2 over 3. Down quark has a charge of negative 1 over 3. I'm going to think of NT up. NT up has a charge of negative 2 or 3. Just NT the charge. NT down has a charge of positive 1 over 3. So how on earth can we get a total hadron of positive 2E? Oh, sorry, negative 2E. Let's try for a meson. I need the charge to be very negative. Oh. So maybe I have... Um, hmm, let's make it as negative as you can. NT up. NT up. So then the charge will be negative 2 over 3, negative 2 over 3, or plus negative 2 over 3. Means the biggest I can go is negative 4 over 3. I can't quite reach negative 2. What if I do it for the baryons? I do 3 NT up. So this is like, dang, dang, cannot. Up, up, up. Uh, then I'll have negative 2 over 3, negative 2 over 3, negative 2 over 3. Means the total charge of this particle, uh, triple up, anti up, will be negative 6 over 3, <gasps> which is negative 2. That's what we're looking for. So with a meson, it's impossible to reach such a big charge, but with a baryon, three of them, if they have negative 2 over 3 charge as their quarks, you could reach the charge of negative 2e for the whole particle. So, hmm, how do we explain that in English, what we just did? Uh, I guess what we can say, that We talk about mesons, we could talk about how mesons don't, cannot reach that. But let's, let's say first, we think it's a baryon. So the hadron particle is in the class of a baryon. I state the answer first. What is the answer? What is the class? Baryon. Why? Uh, so because there's two reasons I could mention here. Firstly, I could talk about meson. Meson can only have a charge of 0 or plus minus 1e. 
You can't have like one over three charge, four over three charge. So just now we did this four over three. Uh, we don't have fraction of charge. We just have charge. It has to be a whole number. Negative two, negative three, so forth and so forth. So mesons can't quite hit negative two over three. Uh, you can also mention that. So it has to be a, a baryon because baryons baryon largest quark charge is negative 2 over 3 or positive minus 2 over 3 so you can have 3 of them to give 2e so a triple up ding 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 gives negative 2e Wow, we have to work backwards, man. Okay, so if you say it's a baryon, that's actually a uh, one mark only. That's the A1 mark. But you need to explain either one of these will give you an M1 mark. So you unlock the A mark. And okay, so the last part. Oh, we can't give the answer already. State a possible quark composition for the hadron. So the easiest one is what we already mentioned. Give a triple up. Wait. Triple up, U, U, U. So you can say... You, 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 or if you want to be more detailed, you can say three NT up quarks inside that hadron particle. So this one is a B1 mark, just to tell them what you think is in the particle. Okay, so that's particle physics in revision. Sure you know, what you need to memorize though is the charge of the at least the up down and top bottom charge sometimes they may ask us about that okay yeah but that's all for this particle physics question and also for the whole paper i think we're done yeah we're done we are done okay any further questions you'll have before i sign off for today scroll all the way back up yeah i think this paper has some traps in it it's uh Hmm. It's great threshold is a little bit lower than the other two, so that might suggest that not as many people did well in this paper compared to the other two variants. So hmm, think about that. Okay, let me click on my screens for a second. So yeah, if you still have any questions, go and revise a little bit. I would highly recommend, as you do practice papers to revi to do revision, you do it in these steps, okay? I'll write as revision tips. So you do, step one, you need to do the paper without the help of mark scheme and under time con conditions. So if you want to prepare for exams, do the paper, give yourself 1 hour 15 minutes, just write whatever BS you can think of, just write it down, okay? Time yourself. Because sometimes our brains panic a bit, right? So we're like, <gasps> Go timer, go timer, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of time. Oh no, oh no. And then as you do a full paper, you are doing cross topic as well. So you're jumping from chapter to chapter. And if you need to skip questions, then you skip questions. It trains the skill. And it, of course, trains time. How the speed. Okay. So once you do the, sorry, once you do the paper, then you need to go and check the mask scheme. And this is when you go find the answers. Before that, you will feel uncomfortable because you're not sure whether what you're writing is correct or not. That is normal. You need to learn to be uncomfortable with what you don't know. I don't know if this is correct or not. Uh, continue. Just continue. Timer's not done yet. So this way you do the mask scheme, you check answer and you mark your work. Mark and do corrections. You gotta work through these two. Okay? So if you're doing an exam preparation, you keep bouncing between these two. And if you have blanks in your paper, that's normal. Just keep working on the blanks. If you have wrong stuff, that's normal. Just highlight the thing that are wrong. Where are the traps that you often forget or get caught in? What are some topics you need to work a little bit more on? You will know if you do full papers. And lastly, ooh, note, there is new syllabus from 2022 onwards. So this is new syllabus so the papers before 2022 they will have some 
news that like some some stuff inside there which is not in the syllabus anymore because they've been moved to A2. There's also a new topic that will appear from 2022 onwards. So there's not many papers as of today, but so do take them preciously. Give yourself time, conditions, market. Okay. Uh, will I do P22? Um, depends on the time. <laughs> depends if I have time. If I do, sure. If not, probably later in October or November. Okay, so I think that's all for today. Just a revision. See you all around. All the best. Have fun.